the first four or five years I was working, I was the only woman in the room or on the construction site or in the office. I now look around me and there's more women. Every, every project I'm on, there's another woman there. My guest this week is Gemma Quinn, who is a chartered engineer. Gemma has an honours degree in civil engineering from the University of the West of Scotland and currently is a temporary works advisor for the CARE group, as well as a volunteer director for the Temporary Works Forum. Gemma has over 15 years of civil engineering experience in sectors such as buildings, rail and aviation. And recently she has been named as a finalist uh, as a, one of the top 100 most influential women in construction, as well as a finalist in the Design and Build UK Industry Pioneer Awards. So Gemma, welcome to STEM with Mr N and congratulations on these awards. Thank you so much and congratulations on your recent award as well. So let's start off with what is civil engineering? Civil engineering stems from the military in a way. Military engineering used to be anything that you used to, to build infrastructure-wise to help the army get from one place to another. Then when we they built back into city street or civilization, they used those skills to help build buildings, railways, infrastructure. So in a way, civil engineering is anything that is designed or built to help humanity. So it's infrastructure, roads, bridges, railways, so that's the transport side of it. There's buildings and then there's the sewage treatment works. So it's anything that we use in life. It's all civil engineering and anything that you build. And once you uh, do a degree in civil engineering, so I'd said there obviously you've worked in different sectors. So does a general civil, en civil engineering degree allow you to do that and spread out across these sectors quite easily? Yeah, so as a graduate, you're kind of fresh. Um, you've got a general understanding of engineering and then when you go to your place of work, that's when you start to specialise or learn about key skills in certain areas. I took a while and went and did lots of different kinds of projects because I'm quite nosy and wanted to learn a bit, a bit about everything. And um, that's why I've got such a broad range of experience because luckily the companies I worked for allowed me to go out and try all these different projects and have a nosy. And eventually you seem to have found your route and your passion within Temporary Works, but can you explain what Temporary Works is? Yes, so Temporary Works is anything used to help support the structure uh, when you're building it or dismantling it. Anything used to help support plants on site, so that could be um, the ground underneath it or a special platform that you create. And it's anything used to support the ground. In short, it's anything that you use that you need to think of in engineering terms to help build the main project that you're working on. I like it because it's in each individual item, whether it is a bit of scaffolding or um, a piling platform or supporting the ground, each item is like a little mini project in itself, which is quite interesting for me. So what does your role as a temporary works advisor for the care group involve you doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, that's kind of hard to tell because not every day is the same. My remit is to basically make sure that everyone that works in my region understands what temporary works is, is competent, so they're trained, uh, got the knowledge, experience, and they've learned enough skills to be able to carry out temporary work safely on site. I then go on site and make sure this is happening. So I carry out inspections. I also review our procedures to make sure that they're up to date with current guidance documents. I provide training to people on site. I offer technical advice. If I see something that doesn't look quite right, for example, or if a team are struggling or just have found something that they're not familiar with, they come and ask me for help. And if I can't help, I pass them on to one of my specialist colleagues and our care professional services team who can design a solution for them. 
So some days I'm on a construction site, visiting a site, looking at things to see how we're doing it safely. Other times I'm stuck in my office, which is my home office here, eh, catching up on emails or writing technical briefs or things like that. So no two days are the same. And is that variety something that you enjoy about that role, that no two days are the same and you're constantly on the go and doing different things? Yes, mostly. Sometimes all the travelling can be a bit tiring, especially if you've got quite a lot of site visits. I cover all of Scotland, North East England and Northern Ireland, but I also have to travel to London for meetings and things like that. So if you've got one meeting on a Tuesday down in London and another one up in Inverness on a Thursday, that can be a bit of a stretch. So I try and work it out so that I'm in one region each time. But, and then also during the pandemic, for example, I couldn't travel to sites as much because of all the lockdown restrictions. So I got to work from a home office on High Speed 2, which is the big new railway that they're building down south. But that was quite isolating because I live alone. Um, and I was stuck just, the only social contact I had was this kind of communication. It was kind of difficult. So I get the best of both worlds. Sometimes if I need a quiet day, I can work from home. But other times when I like to get in the middle of it, um, I get to have sight days. So yeah, it's, it's the best of both worlds. They say, me and my teammates, so there's um, four of us in our team, say that we have the best jobs in care. And we really do, because we get to go out and see all these amazing things happening, but we don't have to actually organise it all. Which is that sounds ideal. So that is up to, to scratch on what you do with the care group. What is the Temporary Works Forum and, and what do they do and what is your role as a volunteer director? What does that involve? Temporary Works Forum is a technical knowledge society of the Institution of Civil Engineers. It was set up about 11, 12 years ago by a group of civil engineers coming together, realising that temporary works might not necessarily be carried out as safely as they wanted to on construction sites. We formed a team and it's grown arms and legs since these first people met up. Now there's four meetings a, a year where we come together and discuss certain topics of temporary works and we catch up and network, which is great. We have an online platform, which is a website where people can post suggestions or questions and all the industry comes together and speaks to each other. And we also have working groups that look at specific topics. My working group looks at cranes and specifically how outriggers are on the ground and the mats that go between the outriggers and the ground. And we're in the process of writing a guidance document on how to calculate and how to decide which mat is the best one to use. My role is to, I, the working group part is separate. My role as director is to lead or to influence and to manage the Tempe Works Forum. There is a group of, I think it's five now, directors, and we Govern it. We have one full time secretary who's also a director. He carries out everything in his, as his day job and he manages everything from organising cups of tea at the meetings to uh, making sure people pay subscriptions on time. He does brilliant work, his name David. He's fantastic. Me, I get an honorary title of, of director. I, I go to meetings. And we discuss where we want the direction of the forum to go. So that's us now fully up to speed with what you do on a day to day basis just now. But I want to go back the way. What first got you interested in STEM and then engineering? So my answer is a wee bit complicated. It was a bunch of a series of uh, not unfortunate events, but a series of events that led to me becoming into STEM. I was always interested to, in sci fi when I was younger. And my uh, physics teacher really encouraged me to apply that enthusiasm into the real world by asking questions such as, why can't you get a decent cup of tea at, at Mount Everest? It's all to do with the fact that you can't boil water at the su sufficient temperature in order for the tea to mature enough. 
because as you get higher up and to do with pressurization, the water boils at a lower temperature than what the tea needs in order to brew. And I find that fascinating. So he really sparked my interest. He's the one that put me forward for going to space school, which was a, a meeting between NASA and Career Scotland. It was the sort of first year that they did it. And I got to go to Strathclyde University and carry out all these experiments about space. I got to make a, like a heart monitor out of like tubes and like a, a oscilloscope, I think it was. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. And an engineer gave us a presentation on it. And if you asked him a question, I can't even remember what the talk was on. He gave you a crisp, shiny, brand new five pound note as an answer. Even if you either got the answer wrong or was just asking a silly question. So I asked the question, I got a five pound note. I was like, wow, being an engineer must be great that you can give money away. You must make millions of pounds. I was a wee bit wrong in my estimate there. I then went with my dad to visit the Falkirk Wheel as it was being built. And I remember him turning to me going, why don't you do that? So I looked into it. Turns out it was a thing called civil engineering. And mechanical engineers also were involved in it. And I went to a newspaper and looked, this just showed my age, went to a newspaper to see how many jobs in civil engineering are um, mechanical. And there was more civil engineering jobs. So I was like, right, that's it. I'm going to be a civil engineer. And I, I went to uni and it progressed from there. And other than the engineer that you met at Space Camp, was there anyone that you looked up to as you were going through your engineering uh, journey? So at uni, you hear about all the greats like Brunel and that kind of thing. Um, and my, my lecturers were pretty cool. There was one called Joe, I can't even remember. Joe Heffernan, we used to call him the Heff. Uh, he was American, and I remember the first day of uni, he was like, you're going to have to get sheets because the future is so bright at being a civil engineer. <laughs> Something cheesy like that. Um, and he, he always came up with well, cracking ideas for us to do in classes and stuff. And then throughout my career, I've met some really incredible engineers, and I've learned from them. There's so many to count on. There's Andy Machen, who um, was like the chief engineer for uh, Morgan and Underground Professional Services. He was my boss, but I got to sit next to him. And I learned so much by just sitting next to him and seeing all the stuff he has to deal with and all the technical engineering questions. I learned so much on that placement. Um, Tony Naylor, he was my engineering manager when I worked on the Edinburgh to Glasgow Improvement Project, a railway project. And he taught me about Tempe Works. And some of um, the lessons I learned from him come out of my mouth verbatim when I speak to other engineers about how to like, control your paperwork, how to assess things, how to look at something. And, and then I've met some really incredible women engineers as well. Um, Caroline Griffin, she was one of the engineers I worked with. She's a few years younger than me, but she has she had so much potential and could just see a problem and go, right, that's what we need to do. And cracked on and fixed the problem before anyone knew it was a problem. <laughs> I've met so many other kind of brilliant engineers. The ones I work with at the moment, my boss, his name's Mark Pring. He is the most laid back, chill person until you challenge him on something and then he's so detailed orientated and, da, 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 and you're like how do you even know all this stuff and just and then through the Temporarks forum there's all these other amazing people that you get to meet and you don't even need to throw your pencil that far and they'll hit some amazing engineers you just have to kind of look around you and sometimes I have to pinch myself that I'm or like wake up from a dream that I'm not because I'm getting to take part in all this. I still think I'm on my summer placement from university. It's only been 15 years, but uh, you know, it's a quite long summer placement, but it's, it's been quite interesting. 
But the award here you've been named as a finalist for, like one of the top uh, 100 influential women in construction or even an industry pioneer, show that you know, there'll be other people sitting there throwing their pencils and it won't need to go very far before they hit you, another influential engineer. So um, that's quite funny when you're saying about it feels just like a summer placement, but you're obviously made incredible strides in your career as an engineer. But it's all been incremental. So you don't know if you're doing it as you do it. And then 15 years have gone past and you look behind you and you go, wow. I'm not the scared little graduate anymore. I'm just the scared grown up now. <laughs> but even that is a, a good point for children and young people, though, that um, you don't achieve your goals in one overnight step. You know, that's been, as you said there, it's been gradual step by step, you know, over 15 years um, to get to that point. So, you know, that's not that's not a point to be dismissed. That's that's something very important. I think people should understand is. And for all of us, it's a gradual step-by-step -step process to get to where we want to go. But when you were saying about the influential engineers, and it's a good point to bring this up. So a lot of them you mentioned were male engineers, although you did obviously say you've come across quite a few influential female engineers. And right now there is a big push for more uh, girls and young women to get involved in STEM. How has the engineering landscape changed for, uh, for women? You know, are there more women coming through in engineering now than there used to be. What's the situation there? When I was at university, there was a class of 40 when we started. There was four women, myself included, at the start of the term. By the end of the four years, 20 people graduated. Two of them were women. So that's what, 10%. And that was sort of the industry at that time. It was about 10%. We're now at about 14, 15, 16%. So that's what, 15 years, we've come up 5% more. More women, that's fantastic. There's a lot more women about. And I've noticed it on a personal level. So the first four or five years I was working, I was the only woman in the room or on the construction site or in the office. I now look around me and there's more women. Every, every project I'm on, there's another woman there every business, every per place I go to, there is women everywhere. Okay, there's not as many as I'd like to see. It's not a 50-50 split, but I'm not the only woman in the room anymore. And it's brilliant. And do you think it makes a difference when uh, girls and young women can see other women ahead of them in that, that role and inspire them? Do you think that, that makes a difference? It's not so much inspiring, it's having someone who understands your point of view ahead of you that you can go to for advice. And it's only taking me to now to find role models that are ahead of me that are within reach or within the company I'm working for that I can go to for advice. That's what I was missing right at the start of my career. Because there wasn't anyone. I was working at Heathrow Airport and I was literally the only woman for miles apart from the passengers on the airplanes because the airport is so big. So it was so weird. It was got to the point where there was men using the women's uh, changing facilities and toilets because they didn't even realise I was on site as a woman. They thought, oh, that just must be the wrong sign. We'll use it anyway. It got quite awkward when I went in and they were like <laughs> de-roping and I was like, yes. <laughs> Women on the door, excuse me. But um, those days are long gone now. And I've noticed how there's like even a cultural shift. People are friendlier. And I can't attribute that all to the fact that there's more women in it, but it helps. I noticed on the other construction sites that, I would, that when more women started showing up, people became friendlier. Or maybe I changed as, as a person and became friendlier towards them. I can't really tell you because it's my own personal experience. And why should, this is not just exclusively for, for girls, um, but why should people pursue civil engineering? What does it give back to you that it makes it a good career? We are in what, recession number three, four, five? 
now since we graduated um, and construction's still got jobs. We're always going to need people. So from a um, security point of view, you're always going to be able to find work in construction and in engineering. You may have to hunt around a wee bit, but it's got job security. If you are the kind of person similar to myself, and I'm assuming yourself, who's interested in how the world works, you will be able to scratch that itch in this kind of role because you will figure out how to build things. You will figure out how I things stand up, how things work in the ground, all this magical, interesting things. So it'll be interesting. And there's so much diversity in civil engineering and also construction and also any form of engineering that you will find some kind of job that you're good at and you'll enjoy. So life is about enjoyment. For me, I find it interesting, so it keeps me engaged and it makes me happy. My advice to anyone who's listening is go find what makes you happy, but also you can make a living out of it. And as long as it's legal and safe, <laughs> and you, like, and does, you know, just put that wee caveat on it. Yeah, we always need to make sure what we're doing is legal and safe. Safe uh, first, legal <laughs> second. <laughs> and have you got a favourite project that you have worked on, something that you go about or you maybe look at uh, again in the future and think, yeah, I worked on that. Have you got a, a favourite project like that? I was on it today. So the Edinburgh to Glasgow line, the, two, the railway line between Edinburgh and Glasgow, and also that leads from Glasgow all the way up to Stirling. On 12 of those bridges, I helped remove the bridge deck raise it up higher and replace the bridge deck. I did all the temporary works. Well, I assisted with all the temporary works for that. So I, I pass all these trains. I, I've just come up from London and uh, about half an hour before this, this call started. And I passed all these bridges that I'd worked on. I was like, that's mine. That's like, oh, that's looking a bit shabby now. Need to get on that one. And uh, all the railway stations, we lengthened the platforms. And I learned so much about engineering doing that. That was Tony Naylor's job, who he was the temporary arts coordinator. I was his deputy. At first, it was just me going around like holding his briefcase. But by the end of it, I was like running projects myself and doing all the coordination and stuff. So to me, that's and it also became incorporated civil engineer and did my presentation on that. And especially when I go into Glasgow Queen Street Station, I look up at one of the bridges that we installed there. And I'm like, that's my bridge. And there's there's a wall right next to my grand's house, right next to the railway, that I worked on for three months. Uh, at, over the winter period, I had to be there on night shift. So it's minus five degrees. I was out there in like five layers of clothing. My grand rolls up. Um, rolls down the window and just laughs at me because I'm like full <laughs> orange and like balaclava and everything. But every time we pass it, they go, that's Jim as well. So there's bits of that throughout the country that can go, that's mine. And that must be a nice feeling to be able to have as you go about going, yep, that's mine. I worked on that. And um, I must say, it's great when we've been talking there about having somebody in front of you that you can see what they're doing and look to for advice. It's great that you agreed to give up your time uh, to do this interview. So Gemma, um, that's us out of time, but I very much appreciate you giving up your, your time to do this. It's been super speaking to you today. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's the first time I've ever been on. Oh, one thing I've forgotten, the Tempe Works Forum, there is a yearbook, which is free to everyone, and you'll find out more about Tempe Works on that. And we also have an e-learning course, which lasts three hours, and we'll get Stuart to put the or sorry, Mr. N, to put the link in the bio. Thank you so much again for your time.